Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by the scruffiest looking nerf herder you've ever seen, Bronson Jacobs, Bronson. Who are you calling scruffy looking? <laughs> well, guys, welcome back to the Game of Thrones podcast, and today we'll be taking a look at Season 7 as a whole. As always, we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so consider following us on those platforms to get episodes as they're released. And if you do listen to us on iTunes, then please leave us a review. It would help us out a lot. And be sure to leave your thoughts down in the comments below, because we may cover them in the next episode. And uh, not only that, but because this is the off-season, we can focus a lot more on questions, theories, characters, and so on. So we will, we will be looking to the comments and private messages for those. Also, before we begin, I want to give a big shout out to Quid. No, they are not sponsoring this video, nor was I paid to say that. But they were sponsoring me throughout Season 7. I'd like to thank them and Mr. Hadi for their professionalism and kindness during that time that we worked together. And, and I'm, I'm sure Preston will agree with me. You'd be surprised at how many companies and even other people on this website don't show either of those things. So once again, thank you to them. Ha, uh -huh. who's Quid? Uh, <laughs> shut up, Preston. And, uh, <laughs> and obviously we've been gone for quite some time. Uh, this is because I decided to take a, like a mini vacation after the season ended, and uh, Preston has been over in the Middle East for almost an entire month, and while over there, his connection wasn't that great, so we couldn't really get a good recording, so sorry about that, guys. But we did manage to record some good stuff regarding the multiple endings announcement for Season 8, and even discussed a really cool theory from someone that you would consider, you would say, is easily one of the best Game of Thrones theorists out there. Uh, the guy's name was Cantus, right? Yes. So these these clips are all available over on patreon.com slash red team review. So if you want to support the podcast, head on over there and you'll have access to those exclusive clips and more. Okay, so Preston. Oh. What? <laughs> I know you're gonna be like, overall, what would you give the number? Like what's your ranking of like one to ten? What would you consider season seven? <laughs> Damn straight. So on a scale from <laughs> one to ten. What would you give this season? Like, you, before we started recording, you fucking correctly guessed my rating for this season. How did you do that? Like, what the fuck? I, I just I just know that you're like, you know, in general, in general, you you, you get excited about something and then you get you, you, you have a little high. You have a I know you have a, like a high ranking in your head and then you see all the negative stuff and it brings you down and then you kind of average it in your head and you're just like, ah, and then you want to be a little positive. So, you know, so you give it a little, like, 0.5 bump up. So I would say, like, I just kind of said, ah, it'll wash. It's a wash, and you're going to say 7.5. That's true. I would give it a 7.5. And like I said, like, but, but here, the, but the, the re you're right. You're right. I see it the first. You're the same way. So fuck you. Don't say that to me. You're the same way. Well, when I see it, I'm like, oh, that was so great. And then, like, the second time watching it, I was like, ah, oh, okay, that's, uh, Mm -hmm. And then I, but but I come back to the fact that I was still entertained and I enjoy the whole thing. So I, yeah, you're right. Seven point five. Uh, what would you give it? I'm assuming you're gonna give it either a five or a six. Yeah, I give it you know mass six, something like that. It's for uh, you. That's very good. For you, for you, <laughs> that's very good. I mean, there's some things. There's some things that I'd give, you know, higher out there. You know, like mm -hmm. if I were talking like this year what I saw that I thought was really great, you know, like, um, like I'm going to say the leftovers, big little lies. Like those were all, those were all really good. Um, what's big little lies. Oh, big little lies is a mini mini series on HBO. It was Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman. Um, and they're dealing with, uh, they're dealing with a lot of different issues, but it mainly surrounds, um, children at school, uh, bullying each other like young kids at school and then everything kind of uh, there's a whole bunch of other things involved around it including um, you know domestic abuse and eventually murder and things like that so well but season seven let's yeah let's just agree that season seven was much better than season six uh, I mean I wouldn't say much better I say it was slightly better than season slightly six. slightly better I gotta yeah. agree I, I think it was much like for season six half of the episodes were good and half of the episodes are crap the other half was crap. And for season seven, most of the episodes are good. I, I enjoyed almost all of them, with the exception of two. That being this season's dreaded episode was not that, not not as unique as the past ones have been. Mm. And the episode four, Spoils of War, that's the one with the uh, Lannister versus Targaryen battle. The first half of that was just kind of boring to me. The second half yeah. was mainly where it was at. 
Um, but like I said, I've seen I've seen this season three times <clears throat> since it's ended. Yeah. And I gotta say that the season was enjoyable. Don't get me wrong. It's way better than six, but I, I'm comfortable at giving it a seven point five, and I'll tell you why. Hmm. Like I said, I enjoy the season, but what I do hate is that when people say the quality isn't there anymore, it is. It's it's still there, if not better. But the problem many people had with it, as do I, is the difficult task of ending character storylines that have been ongoing for years, even in the books, and they're trying to end it as quickly and as okay as they can, yeah. but they failed so fucking hard to give many of the characters proper sends off. And the process, they completely ruined their characters, like Littlefinger, and even Benjen. Like, I didn't even think true. about this, but Benjen had a shitty send-off, too. Oh, I mean, and and that's the, the thing on how you, how you choose to break down how you rank things. So if you take things episode by episode... Um, things can be things can be okay because they'll put something exciting at the end to try to, to try to trick you into thinking that you know this was a great episode. For instance, like the first time I saw the the loot train episode <laughs> uh, with Jamie, you know it's pretty exciting to see those dragons you know flying around everywhere. But if you break things down by by character story, like you say, okay, well where's the Jamie story going and where's the Danny story going and Where's the Theon story? And when you break it down that way and you sort of say, well, things kind of fall apart that way. Um, and obviously on multiple viewings, you become numb to the action and you start paying more attention to the characters. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, definitely the first time I saw all these episodes, they were they were pretty good. And then the second time, you know, they begin to lose their luster. And then the third time, yeah, you're just kind of saying, huh. That 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 didn't really they didn't really think that through, so it, it it depends how you how you rank things and how and how many times you've seen it you know. There was one guy who messaged me. He goes, he he goes, I'm not a Preston Jacob subscriber, but and I fucking hate the guy, but I fucking hate admitting <laughs> how he's right. I go, how is Preston right? He goes, the first time I saw it, I was like, Preston's stupid. This is so cool. And then the second time I saw it with my girlfriend, who wasn't here at the time, I was like. Oh, that was kind of dumb. And then the third time I saw it, <laughs> the third time I saw it binge watching with a bunch of friends, and I completely agreed with almost everything he had to say. So people are on your side; they just have to rewatch it every so. It's it's like that. It's like that one like that one joke about the Bible. Like you're a big believer in the Bible because you've never read it. Once you kind of read it, you're like. Oh. I can see why this person's an atheist. You're like, I believe, I mean, that's the funny thing is almost every atheist has read the Bible mm -hmm. and so they can argue. Um, <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, the idea that, that uh, somehow I'm like George Costanza and that I wear people down and then I'm, I'm in there. Cause yeah, I don't know if you ever saw the Costanza episode. Yeah, I did. Of, he he, the, yeah. the girl he uh he's he's leaving the he's leaving the 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 woman's apartment. The he's like Costanza, and he. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So yeah, I mean the thing is also as I'm preparing my final season review, which should be coming out you know in a few days. Um, it's I break I break everything down by character story, and it's it's. It's tough when you're at the beginning of the season, you're like, okay, well, this is the established problem. You know, like with John and Sansa, the established problem is, okay, he's giving away castles to, to other lordling, to, oh, I'm sorry, he's not giving away castles and Sansa wants him to. And there's this like conflict there. And then the conflict at the end of the season or in the middle is like, is he going to bend the knee? Which none of the lords ever mentioned as a problem, you know, and it's just kind of this assumed thing. Um, and then by the end, it's, it's that he's not there. Um, and so you have these shifting, you have these shifting motivations constantly episode to episode. Uh, and it goes with every character. Like why, why does Jamie and Cersei work as a couple and why don't they work as a couple? And it kind of begins with, everyone telling uh, Jamie that she's a psychotic monster. But as you go through the season, you're like, actually, Cersei is really quite logical. Um, and then by the end, it's, it's not that she's a psychotic monster. He leaves her because she's quite logical. Um, and maybe, maybe that's them turning everything on its head. I don't know if it was really intentional, but uh, you know, 
they, they, they establish things and then they shift the motivations. And then by the end, you're, you're at something else. Um, so I don't know. I, it feels like they're putting every, everything together on the fly rather than planning it out in a, in a, se- in a season type of arc. Well, we're supposed to believe that Cersei is, is the psychotic monster because of what she's done in the past. And even right, and then, what she does to Ilaria, too. Right? Yeah, but I mean, even then you could argue that like the only reason Cersei did those things was to protect herself and to protect her family and her legacy, which is what Tywin instilled on her. Cersei is, is really hyper-logical this season. Probably more logical than any time in season one through six. Like I, th- I kind of feel like the showrunners want to present her as this revenge-focused, vindictive monster. Um, you start out with with uh, um, Olena saying like, "Oh, she's a disease to Jamie," like warning him, "She's a disease." I couldn't believe the monstrous things she did, like blowing up the sept, which is a you know pretty horrible thing, um, very horrible thing. But this season. Everything is everything she does, except for torturing Ilaria, which is over the top. I mean, maybe not compared to what Ilaria did to her, but it's it's the only moment of revenge and vindictiveness that Cersei has the whole season. The rest of the season, she is quite logical. You know, her her decision not to go north is very logical. Her her um, it's it all fits it all fits, but it, it's odd because. Her How decision to uh, have uh, the, the White Walkers and uh, the Dragon Wolf Alliance kill each other off and she'll pick off the uh, remaining stragglers. Yeah, I mean... That was I, also pretty good, too. Yeah, I mean, I admit that Jamie's being logical, too. Both of them are being logical. Jamie's just saying, well, wait a minute. Okay, we either... Either the dead wins and we get killed by the dead or the living wins and then we get killed by the living. That, that's, a, that's a good logical argument. And Cersei's argument is, well my army is small like if why why should i go up there and help them there i'm not going to make a difference one way or the other i mean if i go up there we i you know my army gets killed by the dead or you know if uh if not my army is killed and and i mean i mean an even worse position when the living wins it's Mm -hmm. it all makes sense um i i i understand cersei's position and it's uh it but that, that's not what everybody's been telling me for all of these seasons leading up to it. Um, but I kind of like that, to be honest. Like how every other character is basically telling Jamie she's a horrible person. And he's not seeing that. He's seeing what we're seeing, that she's a logical person who's, you know, just trying to protect herself and her family. And that that's kind of like, I don't know if you ever had this, but I've had this before. Where, like, I'm in a relationship with someone and their side or my side thinks that the other person is horrible for for me or for you know mm. me to them and like just they're, they're not seeing what i'm seeing all you guys are, are seeing you know just rumors and what you want to but you're not really seeing the the person i am i, I i've been in, in situations like that before and that's kind of what jamie's in right now you know everybody's telling him that cersei is a bad person but he doesn't see it that way he sees it as her being logical and uh she kind of is danny brought a bunch of raving dothraki to the realm I don't know. I mean, even if Danny wins or loses, how can she really keep a hold on them? So Cersei's not wrong in a lot of sense, and Jamie sees that. Yeah, I mean, and it's it does make the Jamie leaving her for that um, the the odd thing. I think in my videos, I, I made the made the point that all of these other horrible things that Cersei did were not deal breakers, like blowing <laughs> up the sept, blowing up the sept, and leading to her son's suicide, like or you know her infidelity. Like all those, like those things, and because we, we, well, in the book we know Jamie is a very jealous man. I guess we don't know in the in the show, uh, <clears throat> but those things seem like <clears throat> they would destroy the relationship more than her decision not to send troops north. Mm-hmm. And yet, but that's the straw. That, you know, weirdly, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. I guess. I don't know. Is is that just bad writing? Like they didn't think it through. They wrote it on the fly. I think so. I think they knew they needed to have the breakup happen, and so they said, "Well, what's the what's going to be the breakup? You know, how are they going to manage it?" But um, did they really break up, though? I mean, was that really a breakup? Because they they fight so many times. Well, I mean, he's marching away, right? Yeah. Um. Did he take an army with him, or did he just go alone? I think he's just going alone. <laughs> 
It's just him. You know? So I can already predict what's going to happen. He's going to go alone. He's going to be in danger. And Cersei loves him too much. Yeah, and she's going to be forced to send in her troops because she doesn't want him to die. And I don't know. I think I think it's more... Um, he's going to be going up there and then all of a sudden Bronn's going to be there too. and So they can continue their, their bromance. Mm-hmm. And then I think it'll be about her and her and a Euron romance, I guess, in nah. the final season. You're, uh, with only six episodes, they're going to focus on the Euron versus Theon. Yeah, I mean, it's odd. I don't know. I'm trying to think, like, predicting out season eight what's going to happen. Like, is it just going to be, like, Jamie and, da- I mean, uh, John and Danny should be busy with the Night King. Like, constantly, right? Mm-hmm. Like, the Night-, the Night King's army is you know, a a month's march from Winterfell. So in the show, that's like two days. Um, (laughs) So like it's, they should, they should be occupied. They should be, you know, they shouldn't be saying, Oh, where's Cersei? Where's Cersei? Meanwhile, Cersei will have the golden company and Euron. I, I, will they, will they end up fighting amongst themselves or something and kill it, kill themselves off? I don't know. Um, because Cersei should just be sitting there the whole time, right? Shouldn't mm-hmm. she just have the Golden Company and just sit? Well, I can see Euron going to grab the Golden Company, bringing them back, and while Euron's in the Red Keep, Theon takes it upon himself to sneak into his flagship and rescue Yara if she's being held there. I can see that as a thing, you know? Because, mm, I mean, yeah. I mean, Theon, there's no way Theon, with, with as little ships as he has left, is going out there to intercept the silence while they're bringing the Golden Company. We need the Golden Company here. Yeah. By the way, did you see the casting news on on that? They they I've say not. that there's a bunch of well, they say there's a bunch of cell swords, you know, in their forties major roles that they need to uh, uh, fill. One of them might be John Con. Well, um, they did mention John Con in the uh, Blu-ray extras. Like they they don't mention him by name, but but wasn't John Con handed the king to uh, the Mad King? He was briefly. Yeah, yeah. So so Varys in one of Varys's little uh, like extras on the Blu-ray. I forgot, I forgot if it was season two or three, where they, uh, probably three, where they talk about Robert's Rebellion. Um, Varys does mention a previous Hand of the King who failed to stop Robert during the Rebellion and was exiled for it. So oh. might we might be getting John Con or maybe someone that kind of looks like John Con as like a wink or, you know, like a wink to who the character is. But uh, one of the things that I actually really disliked about this season, and I'm, and you did too, and a lot of people did too. Like, I, like everybody calls us crazy for criticizing it. You motherfuckers have the same issues we have. Uh, <laughs> like, people really do. Um, y- like, you have characters who slouch around and have nothing to do. And in an attempt to give them interesting shit to do, it comes off as rushed, boring, or pointless. Like, Gendry mm. being, like, a thing for only two episodes, and that's it. You know, and, yeah. and Davos. Davos I've had an issue with ever since season four. He does the same thing he's been doing for, like, ever. And... <laughs> Just, with, just Dav- with different I mean, people. This is Davos on Prozac, though. I mean, Davos <laughs> is out of character this season. He is just, he is just on. You know, he's so happy-go-lucky this entire season. Really, you think so? Oh yeah, he's like walking around Dragonstone, being like, "Yeah, John, you should, you should go have sex." And look, it's my Sandy, and and <laughs> hey, we're in King's Landing, and hey, Tyrion, you killed my son. That's a joke. And then like, <laughs> hey, Gendry, you know, like he he's so how did he all of a sudden get so happy? To I be honest, understand. to be honest, I think everybody forgot that Davos had a son, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I'm very happy that they that they threw that bone there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do like I, I'm glad they made that reference uh, because Jesus, you know, it was an important thing. It was the whole reason. Well, it was a. It was the whole reason he hated Melisandre and then forgot about it. <laughs> and then and then Shireen happened and he hated Melisandre again. But um Yeah, I mean Davos Davos was just kinda there. They're they're giving him things to do. He was out of character, he was happy. I mean, I, I, w- I wouldn't go as far as saying Davos was out of character. I mean his his whole job for, for Stannis was to help Stannis get like, you know, people on his side and talk. Stannis wasn't a good talker. So Davos did the talking for him, like we saw him with the Iron Bank situation. That's yeah. what Davos did here for John, and you know he's constantly talking to people, you know, mending things. I guess he's just there as a character who kind of needs to be there. He's John's hand, I guess. So I guess he but needs to be around. 
that's that's kind of sad though, because because so what Davos did for Stannis, like Davos was well in both the book and show, he's he's Stannis's morality and he's Stannis's voice, like two things that occasionally Stannis forgets, and so. And he plays that he plays that role, you know. He reminds him that that you know maybe you shouldn't be killing Gendry uh, until Stannis just says no, no, we're still going to kill Gendry. And then you know he he helps out with the Iron Bank and the show. Um, he's Stannis's. He's he does the things that he makes up for Stannis's shortcomings. The problem is is that John doesn't have those same shortcomings. Uh, like they did have one scene in season six where Davos you know, talks to talk and, and brings over Lyanna Mormont and her and her six soldiers. <laughs> but, you know, where was there a moment, you know, this season where Davos did that, like made John remember, you know, to keep his eye on the on the ball or or when John's words, you know, weren't there, you know, Davos was. It, it didn't happen. He just he was there for comic relief. He had the the. This is John. This is John Snow. He's King of the North. Moment, and that was about it. Um, you know, the Gendry scene. He sends a raven. I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to think of things Davos did. Not much. It's it, it's too bad because you know he's. It would have been nice to see Davos playing that role that he's good at. Mm-hmm. But being, John, but he can't hand. play that role with John though, because John is fucking perfect. I I hear John has like a twelve inch cock, and he can uh, lift mm, up three cars yeah. with one hand. You know, uh, he has course, laser beam of eyes, of course. Uh, and uh, he, but he you know, convince who... Rose Leslie to marry him. You know. <laughs> Cold blooded, damn dude. Uh, but, but but they're getting married. They're getting married. Yeah, they are. But uh, I think Jorah had it worse. I mean, Jorah was just kind of there. He didn't really do much. Oh, yeah. He was a part of the Fellowship in the same way that C-3PO is a part of Star Wars. He's there, but you just don't give a shit. You just expect him to be there. I mean, Jorah's there, I guess, because Danny's retinue is uh, coming, becoming a little short. So we got to give C3- her... First of all, how dare you with <laughs> C-3PO? C-3PO... Uh, first of all, he stops the trash compact. Well, maybe that's R2, but he tells R2 <laughs> to stop the trash compactor. And then at the end, he, he saves, he, he translates for the Ewoks and gets the Ewoks on their side. To be fair, we have a Jedi here. We can fucking slaughter those little bastards, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> C-3PO had a function, but yeah, Jorah, Jorah's function this season. Uh, he kills the bear, uh, with, with the dragon glass dagger. Um, but anybody could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> he no, that's it. He he kills a bear with a dragon glass dagger, and that is <laughs> that is his entire um, contribution. So that's my fucking problem. You bring back these characters. They go away because they have to film, like, another movie or something. And they come back, and it ruins the whole flow of everything. Giving Jorah Grayscale would fucking served no purpose. This is why I said, like, he should have gone off to some faraway land where they have, like, dark magic or some bullshit. And he had to give a part of himself, or maybe he's on borrowed time. You know? Like, it's just... Whatever. So, I mean, uh, so one other thing that Jorah did by accident is because... Sam cured his grayscale. He was he was forced to to transcribe those books, and while transcribing those books, he found out about um, uh, the annulment. So that happened. But but John could have. But, but but here's the thing though. It doesn't really matter because even if even if they told John he's the rightful king, he's not gonna want it. Right, and Bran could have found that information out. And plot wise, like he was already looking in books. So they could have just had him find it in a book that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, they didn't need to have it be Jorah's grayscale forced transcription plot to get to that. But, um, but yeah, other than that, Jorah had no function. <laughs> Brienne had Brienne had no function. Yeah, like, like I said, these George, uh, not George, uh, Dave and Dan, they don't know what to do with characters who are just idle. You know, I saw Brienne multiple times throughout the season, and the only time she ever really mm. did anything was the last episode when she talks to Jamie, I guess she convinces him, and that terrible fight scene with her and Arya. Right, like, like I had no problem with Podrick, and then, and then this season, I fucking hated Podrick, because I'm like, <laughs> why are you even here? <laughs> like, what is, what is your function? 
<laughs> like everyone is just kind of like ha- almost half almost maybe at least one third of the characters are all kind of waiting for season eight because season eight isn't when they when when they're all gonna i guess shine you know Ar- Aria, Aria was hands down the most insufferable character this entire season. All right, well, let, well, let's because we, we've been we've been all over the place. Uh, let's yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's let's talk about the North first, and I will say this: okay. the, the North was enjoyable for the first two episodes. I did like it. I liked the politics. There was some fallout from the last season regarding the Umbers and Cardstarks. Mm, I'm mm. glad they got the whole that that thing out of the way. The whole issue yeah. of Sansa versus John was taken into account a little. It was yes, nice. They- they, they did spend a lot of time solving or at least acknowledging the problems of season six. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, sometimes it's lampshading, but lampshading is better than nothing. Uh, explain um, what lampshading is for the people who weren't here for that explanation last oh, time. Oh, so, so, so lampshading is when, is when there's an obvious problem and the writers know there's an obvious problem. And so the characters will, will acknowledge the problem. <laughs> which they, they you know and it's it comes from the olden days where if you're doing a comedy routine and they're chasing after a character and he puts a lampshade on and then all of a sudden he's a lamp and all of the characters like all of a sudden don't know he's there like <laughs> the writers the writers are winking at the audience going we know this is stupid but we're giving we're we're, we're winking at you and acknowledging that it's stupid and so that we're not trying to trick you because you know if you don't acknowledge it, the, you know, the, the audience is like, oh, are these writers just assholes? Like, are they, uh, do they think that we wouldn't notice? And so it's a way for the writers to say, yes, we notice. We understand that you notice. We're all going to notice it, but let's just let's get through on. it. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's better than nothing. Like it's still crappy because it's not, an, it's not a true explanation, but it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes, it makes watchers feel better. So it, the, the, you know, the fact that Sansa did say, like, yeah, I won the Battle of the Bastards, which apparently, you know, because everybody last season didn't seem to understand that Sansa won the Battle of the Bastards. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, her bringing it up and making that point, like, you know, it's nice that the point is made. You know, it's still illogical, but at least the writers acknowledge that it's there. You know, and they're not trying to pull one over us on us, you know. Well, I like that. I like that there was a little discord between them. But I will say one thing kind of annoyed me is that they didn't address the issue with House Bolton's lands and their castle, the Dreadford, because they were like they were a major thing for the past three seasons. So it's kind of weird we didn't get any resolution with that. You know, they just mm. kind of glossed over it. I was kind of hoping we'd see Sansa go off and want to want it ter- torn down and their lands given to you know some of the allies who helped like maybe like the wildlings or uh, uh who helped out in the cause it was uh oh fuck it was the mormons and then everybody else I forgot. the mormons uh, and, and then the, it was it was the hornwoods and then some some sort of new northern house that i forgot the name of it had like yellow balls and like on a blue yeah. field and we all thought that was house erin at first but it wasn't right they're the ones that and brought then- the calvary yeah, and and I know that Manderley didn't do anything, and Glover didn't do anything, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I think it was House her. Kerwood, but who cares? I kind of yeah. just hated that uh, Kerwin, House yeah. Bolton was a major antagonist in the North for a long time, and they didn't really address what goes on, what happens to these like these these exiled houses' lands. You know, like what about their what? castle? Yeah, what about their castle and their castellan? Like. You know, like the Dreadfort still is going to have people holding it mm-hmm. that are loyal to House Bolton. And then who inherits who inherits it, you know, and and all of these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The um, it was a bit odd, in fact, and I'm not sure what the what message they're they're trying to say about about everything, uh, specifically with with regards to family and houses and continue and continuation of the system because you know on on the one hand sansa's kind of saying let's shake things up in the north and give castles to other people and john kind of has the position of no these are ancient houses and we're not going to destroy them and we're going to continue things on like ned umber and alice Karstark are going to continue on we're not going to destroy these houses. Yeah, but Ned Umber and Alice Karstark are the remaining family members of uh, those houses. The House Bolton doesn't have any more people. Sure, and and they should have they should have definitely uh, like gave <laughs> the Dreadfort to someone. Um, you know, probably. You honestly think they should have given the Dreadfort to someone? Because if I was Sansa, I would want that entire fucking family 
and their and anything belonging to them destroyed and burned to the ground and torn down as a reminder not to fuck with the Starks. I mean, you you, you said this in a in a previous podcast episode. There's a reason yeah. that there's a reason heads go on spikes and put outside the territory to yeah. show as a warning. Sure, but you don't. The castle didn't do anything. So as Sansa <laughs> said, I mean, I would I would give it to House Royce. If if I were running the North, I would say okay, House Royce. Give it to the have, the men have, of the Vale. Yeah, you have the largest army. You guys, you guys won the war for us. It gives them a reason to stay up there. So you give you give it to House Royce or somebody else like that. You know, somebody else from the from the Vale. As a reward, um, but but the show is trying to make some sort of statement about about loyalty and family and things like that. But at the same time, it's trying to make the opposite position because they also say, okay, Daenerys is not guilty for the crimes of her dad. And, and, um, and, and Ned, you know, Ned being a person that took, you know, that overthrew the Mad King, like John isn't responsible for his father's sins either. Mm Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I don't know. It, it, it's an odd. It's an odd mix to talk about. Well, I'm not responsible for the. I'm not responsible for the negative aspects of my ancestors, and yet, and yet, I get to reap all the benefits of my ancestors. Like I get to claim that I'm the real queen, Daenerys, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm not guilty for everything that that my father did. Um, the same thing with Ned Umber and Alice Karstark. Like. They, you know, they somehow get to inherit these castles, the benefit of their ancestors, but they don't have to pay for what their ancestors did. I guess you could argue that the North has different rules. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe they're pointing out the hypocrisy of our own society that that we all go around claiming that oh, we're not responsible for the crimes of our parents and, and our ancestors, but we reap the benefits of them constantly. You know, I uh, I sense a little uh, social justice warrior in that. Uh, sure, that little sure. sentence. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, but I mean, a lot of people would be like, "Well, I had nothing to do with slavery." You know, oh and, well, my god, you know, but you, you do you do reap the benefits of, of of that. I mean, America became this booming, powerful country because because of the cotton trade. You know, so of course, of course, like you're reaping benefits of it. So of course, you're somewhat. Re- you know, you're, you have some responsibility to the negative aspects of it too, and so it's 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 a weird it's a weird thing that they're playing with, um, and I'm not I'm not sure where they're going with it because on the one hand Daenerys is trying to break the wheel, but on the other hand she's the rightful uh, monarch through heredity, so uh, it's 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 all it's all a contradiction. My problem with the North is you know you have a lot of characters sitting around doing nothing. And did, they're doing things that they normally wouldn't do. Arya and Sansa's little confrontation thing was just, my opinion, poorly done. I think everybody agrees on that. It was kind of poorly done. Uh, There's a lot of fans arguing that, you know, it wasn't poorly done. Arya had, uh, Arya had... Someone sent me something on Instagram and I was trying to find it. Whoever sent me that, like, Arya post, please send it to me again on Instagram. Someone sent mm. me, like, a, a post on Instagram about how Arya was in the right to confront Sansa. Because, you know, oh, e- ever since Arya knew Sansa, like, Sansa always took the other side. The whole thing with Joffrey, Sansa's a liar. And the whole thing with Joffrey kind of proves that, you know. And, um, yeah, I get that. But at the same time, like, my whole argument was that they're grown up now. They're past that petty bullshit. I mean... Well, this gets back, this gets back into the contradiction. So, so a lot of Arya's speeches were about the system being screwed up. She makes a lot of talk. She she gives a lot of lip service to that. Like, oh, you know, the the slow clap of of Ned and the uh, and him and her thinking that the system was broken, and then her wanting the the faces so that she could she could be a new person and within the patriarchy and things like that. And then, so she's against the system, but at the same time, she somehow you know, ultra pro John and, you know, killing people that are against John and things like that. And he's part of the system. And for some reason she blames Sansa for the patriarchy, even though she's also a woman that had to deal with the patriarchy and, and use just different means to, to, to rise. So I'm not sure, 
really what what was going on with 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 Arya's criticism at all. Um, so what you're basically saying is poorly done, probably done on, done on the fly. Yeah, it was definitely done on the fly. Because mm-hmm. because I mean, there, and the thing is that you know it's not like I'm pulling this out of anywhere and being a you know like I say a, a an SJW because I'm not like they <laughs> they're like it's it's quite obvious that that Sar that Sansa and Arya are. Uh, in in our story have always been diametrically opposed as Arya being the gender bending uh, feminist character and and Sansa being the traditional femininity character and this I mean it's quite clear and obvious right down to the names of their direwolves being Lady and Nymeria mm-hmm. Nymeria being this you know warrior queen feminist warrior queen mm-hmm. and Lady being embodiment of traditional femininity I mean this is this is not this is not hidden in any way it's quite it's quite obvious. So, you know, each of them had to do their different things for, for agency and survival in the story. And Arya's bringing up, you know, all of the... She brings up the sexism, like, multiple times this season. But for some reason, Sansa is the focus of it. Um, which I'm not sure why Sansa is the focus of it. If Arya was supposed and, to stay in character, she would side with Sansa, who Sansa came... Uh, rose to power in her own way and, you know, used what she had to her advantage, which is like, you know, Sansa is the feminist here this season. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, she, in, in, in every sense, in the, in the sense that she, like, her ability, um, her ability allowed her to rise. Um, and and she's now a quite able ruler. The entire season, they show her being an able ruler, a better ruler than John. Um, and so... Yeah, it's 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 a it's very odd that that if you're talking about like in a in a in a mer- you know if we're talking about a meritocracy, which is what kind of we want, like Sansa won the war, Sansa won the Battle of the Bastards. She's she's a much better ruler than John. Like she should be the choice for Arya to be to be queen, but Arya just likes John and wants to kill people. And then in the end, like they come to peace over killing Littlefinger together? Wait, wait, wait. Did they come to peace, or was the whole them arguing just a part of the plan? I mean, that's the thing is, first of all, killing... No, it's definitely not part of the plan. So they were arguing for real? They're definitely arguing for real. Are you sure of that? Because I honestly got the vibe that it was a part of the plan. Did did the showrunners reveal it in, like, a a behind-the-scenes thing? Apparently there was a deleted scene where Sansa is going to put Arya on trial, but then she talks to Bran. And Bran ex machina's the whole situation. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't. Everything that's been going on. I, I'm glad they put removed that. I, I wasn't a big fan of that. Um, but but so so what you're trying to say here is is that Arya's supposed to be the feminist. She's supposed to be the rogue, the one that goes against the rules. She's supposed to be the feminist. Yeah. And right. just this once, she's not a feminist, all because she likes John, who is I guess the embodiment of the patriarchy for this uh, for the North. I mean, I, I I suppose. <laughs> That would I would like that that reversal because Sansa I mean, it, it, was originally it is, it is not. It's a reversal. Yeah, Sansa right? it was. Is, it is. Sansa was the lady, and now she's the feminist. And Arya was the feminist, and now she is kind of siding with the patriarchy when she wasn't originally. I, I would like that reversal. But I mean, they it, did, they did poorly. I, I, you know, I would almost say like I know it's accidental, but it's a little it's a little it's a little funny where. It, I I would love to be like oh it's clever in the end but I know it's not I know it's accidental but like <laughs> Arya Ar- like Arya is the one who used gender bending and 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 uh, that role to get to a point where she's now defending traditional patriarchy through John Sansa is the one that rose up through the traditional system using traditional femininity and is now in the feminist position of ruling through her merit and and there's a clash it's it's all jumbled um so and then but then in the end like in the end like brand just ex machina the situation and they kill Littlefinger and everything's happy and everything is happy in the end so it's just odd and while we're on the topic of Bran, real quick, I honestly hate what they did to Bran. Like, him ex machina, the whole Sansa Arya situation is kind of dumb, and I'm glad it's it's a deleted scene and not a part of the whole thing. But, like, I, I get why he's such a robot, because all those memories, all that information is just... 
I guess it overflows who he really is, whatever. But I just, I just hate how they don't really go into detail as to why he is so robotic. But the Sansa thing is a shame because Sansa's not my favorite character. However, I, I wanted her to go in and kill Littlefinger on her own. And having to use Bran to do it really diminishes her character in a sense. Like, I, like everybody knows I love Littlefinger. He's my favorite. And he has to go down by Sansa's hands. But in the sense, she didn't really defeat him. Bran did. She doesn't. She doesn't defeat Littlefinger. A, a chance, a chance, omniscient, like godlike character arrived and handed everything to her on a platter. Mm-hmm. So, like we, we as viewers are robbed of, of Sansa defeating Littlefinger, which is what we always wanted, right? Yeah, like, like I love Littlefinger, but even I know he has to be defeated in some way by this character he's constantly obsessing over, and he's very naive. And almost kind of dumb in a sense, with because uh, mm. we spoke about it on the uh, the Patreon exclusive about how um, Sansa in the books she's talking to Miranda, and uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Jon Snow, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, like I kind of don't want to believe that 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 their argument was real the entire time. It would make more it would make it more clever, and that the the bonds of their bonds are still kind of there even after all this time. Because, like, if they were arguing the entire time and only Bran came in to save the whole family at the very last second, that's kind of dumb. Like, you guys really couldn't see through this. But then you have, like... <laughs> but 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 if, the, if their plan was to fool Littlefinger the entire time and they were so convincing that they got him the very last moment, like, that would have made more sense to me. The whole thing was just stupid, but that was would have been I mean, the same order, I mean, in order for it to be a plan the whole time, like, they would have... Like, Littlefinger must be hiding under beds and, like, hiding behind barrels, like, in every scene. You know, like... Well, no, no. <laughs> it's like I said before, like, it would make more sense for them to argue in open rooms without, without, without the door closed, like out in the open where people could hear them, you know, because Littlefinger's whole thing is his network of spies. And mm. that would make more sense to me. But uh, I honestly, I, I, like, I, I, I don't, it's not that I'm calling you wrong, I'm not saying you're wrong, it's just I, I hope <laughs> that you are wrong and that their whole argument thing throughout this entire season was planned the entire time just to catch him. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't seem possible. It just doesn't seem possible. <laughs> like, he would have to be on all those parapets. They were in a private room, like, a couple times. Like, in their in their parents' chambers, in, in Arya's chambers. You know, they had all these arguments about it. Um, no, it just wouldn't have, it just wouldn't have happened. Well, You'd have, well, while we're on the topic, Littlefinger, we spoke about this before, he had the worst Dave and Dan treatment this season. I would say yes. his character was shit on and given possibly the worst death anybody could have had being killed yes. by Arya in the weird uh, Jedi Master Yoda kind of kind of way. Um, I don't know, man. Like, it's the 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 ending you you envisioned for Littlefinger when we last spoke about it was way better where he, his argument of him having to do what he needed to do to survive, just like Varys gave that same argument to Danny. Yeah, that would have, you know, reigned true. Uh, he would have been, he would have been, the only thing they could really could have gotten him, like, they couldn't even get him on killing Lysa. The only thing they really could have gotten him on was betraying Ned. So, yeah, because he did save her multiple times. He saved her against the Boltons. He saved her against Joffrey and he saved her against Lysa. So, yeah, like the, I, I, <laughs> God, she knew about all of those things mm-hmm. forever. Like the, the big reveal was, <clears throat> the big reveal was, was was the the him betraying ned and then i guess they're trying to make they were definitely trying to make the dagger a thing it didn't really make sense like who cares if he told cat that Tyrion was the like Tyrion should have died like do they really care about Tyrion? like who cares about Tyrion? you know like oh little figure tried to kill Tyrion once oh well I, don't know. I guess I guess the letter I guess the fake letter that that he sent with Lysa to to send Ned south, but uh, I don't know. I really did like the ending that we envisioned for him in the last podcast. With uh, you know they have a trial and it turns on him, and despite him saving Sansa from Joffrey and Sansa from Lysa and basically helping Sansa win the Battle of the North, he is still guilty of betraying Ned, even if it was. You know, to save his skin with Joffrey and the Lannisters, he did still betray Ned. And the whole thing, 
just doesn't go his way. And they allow him to keep his life, but he is exiled from the north. Because he saved Sansa multiple times, he's allowed to keep his life. They exile him from the north. And the last shot of him is that you see him from behind walking into the forests. You know, and the audience has a sense of, like, there's no way he could survive. It's, it's freezing temperatures out. And there's just this sense in the back of your head that, yeah, he's going to die. But what if he doesn't? You know, like, like, there's no way he could survive walking out of the north with, like, barely any winter clothes in, 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 in the snow. There's no way he could survive. But there's always that And then, that and then, he, and then he shows up in season eight with, with Melisandre. <laughs> with Melisandre. Like, yeah, that'd, like, yeah, that'd be something. <laughs> last time you said Euron, but okay, I'll take Melisandre too. <laughs> <laughs> sure, with Euron, as Euron's lover. I don't know. <laughs> like... That's a little too much. But uh, I like that. Too, he was too good of a character to be taken out that way. Mm-hmm. A- a- and in such a sad whimper. You, you, I know, that was that was fucking pathetic. I, I, I love how, like, even though everybody fucking hated him, he stole the scene. He stole the scene. And, yes. um I mean, despite his, despite his rotating accents <laughs> and all of those things, like, he, he was... One of the great, he was one of the greatest characters in the show, if not the greatest character in the show, um, for the, you know, for the first few seasons. A lot of, a lot of, and, yeah, it, it, the, the one thing I find fucking weird is that there are very, Littlefinger, I wouldn't say he's one of the main characters, I would say he's like one of the secondary characters, the characters that are prominent yeah. throughout the series, but not always the focus. And yeah. a lot of the secondary characters were giving, in a sense, satisfying conclusions, you know, the way Elena went out was badass, Alaria. Mm-hmm. We don't have her in confirmation that she died, but if she, if that's how she goes out, still good. Um, the Sand it's Snakes. Fitting. It's fitting. It's yeah. fitting. The Sand Snakes, uh, once again, I thought that was fine. Uh, who else died this season? Um, Thoros of Mir going out that way. I wasn't a fan. Um, who else went out? Hmm. I did. Fuck. Um, oh, I mean, Beric and Tormund might have gone out at the end. Yeah, Tormund really should have. At least Tormund, that would have that would have given it, that would have given it a gut punch. But what I'm trying to say here is, it, it's nice to have some of these characters go away, not to die, but just go away or whatever, because it does keep that aura of mystery and unease that maybe someday, you know, they'll come back. So we should still be on our guard. Kind of like how Empire Strikes Back ended. Leia saved Luke, and the rebellion lives on. But we took some losses and learned from it. Killing Littlefinger would be like right. way too easy. And for a man like him, whose reputation and connection is everything, like stripping him of that, it, to me, seems like a better death. I actually, you know, here's here's the thing about like many shows try to end plots by just killing people, which I don't think is a satisfying ending all of the time. Like sometimes people, you know, their story needs to end without them dying. Like dying is just kind of it's just a little too easy. Wouldn't have been I. You know what I would have done? What if they, what if they cut off Littlefinger's tongue and then exiled him? Because his whole weapon in life was was like his, his his talking. And if you took away his ability to talk, like took away the one thing he has, like his tongue, like how could he survive? True. You know, like that that would have been like an almost more fitting ending to Littlefinger than killing him. You know, taking away the one thing he has. Um, you know, kind of like Jamie getting getting his hand cut off. Like this was his his agency in life was his was his sword hand. And he I was that hand. He w- Littlefinger is yeah. that tongue. But now with that gone, he's nothing. Right. It's, it was the same with. I mean, it's the same with Theon. Like, even though Theon, I mean, Theon defined himself by his by his. Um, his sexual uh, abilities and his ability to shoot a bow and both of those are taken from him. And so, you know, his fingers are taken so he can no longer use the bow and his penis is taken from him. So he can no no longer have sex with women and he no longer has his good looks Uh, in the book. You know, he's, he's, he's a very good looking guy. Not that Alfie Allen is bad, but he's just, he's not as stunning as, as book Theon. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if you take these things away, the, his, their traditional modes of power, what do these characters become? Who do they who do they become next? Um, and so the, you know it'd be interesting to see what would happen to Littlefinger without his tongue. Like what would what would he do? So let's talk about the Lannisters this season. Now the Lannisters this season. Uh, last time 
last season they were kind of a mixed bag for me. I wasn't I wasn't a big fan of them because, you know, Jamie, Cersei, and Tyrion, they always just they they, they, they kind of just sat around like just complaining about these people. Cersei's whole mm. story arc, yet last season was basically the High Sparrow is a mean jerk. I'm not leaving the Red Keep. Protect me, Mountain. And Jamie's whole thing is that yeah. like I want to fuck him up, but I can't because you know my hand and you know blah blah blah. And Tyrion's whole thing is he just sat around making bad jokes. Yeah, the 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 t-shirt um, motto I, I drink and I know things. <laughs> and um, go ahead. Well, what's so what's odd is both Cersei and Tyrion uh, shift characters this season. So, or, or at least from what they what they were. So like early, early Cersei is I'm doing everything for my kids, and then the kids start getting um, killed off, and then. You're supposed to say, well, it's her descent into madness, right? So we end season six like, oh, her kids have been taken away from her. She's descended into madness. We're going to have fucking crazy ass Cersei. Season seven begins and she's not crazy ass Cersei. She's super logical Cersei. Like I'm going to pay off debts by taking the, the Tyrell's gold and then I'm going to get, you know, more troops and i'm going to make an alliance with euron these all make sense i'm good then why bring my my force i'm going to let my allies or let my opponents kill die so i can win in the end very logical so we didn't see the descent into madness which we were kind of all expecting um Tyrion, yeah he starts out being this um lost character who's into alcohol and prostitutes and then you know he goes on his his mission to find daenerys he's still drinking all the time and then all of a sudden now he's like very serious and logical um he makes really bad choices like he has really bad plans but he's very rational about what he's doing Mm -hmm. um they so both of them were were out of character from what we saw before well, in a sense, it's not. You're kind of right, but to me, it's it's kind of like a shift because Cersei's whole thing before was that every plan she had was awful and garbage and always backfired, and now every plan yeah, she now, has, every plan she has now is just amazing. And then every plan Tyrion had before worked, and now every plan he has now sucks. So I I do like that how it's yeah. a shift. But uh, Tyrion this season, do you think it's you think it's intentional or do you think it's accidental? You you really don't want to give Dave and Dan like all that credit, don't you? Like you really don't. I don't know. Don't I don't know. <laughs> like and you're right though that every single plan that Tyrion did this season just fell apart. Mm-hmm. Like, and they kept listening to him. <laughs> but he drinks and he knows things, so he, we have to listen to him. Tyrion is a fan Let's favorite. See. We need him around. Nobody cares about Brienne, but we need Tyrion around. Ah, uh, where do you think? they were going with the control like Tyrion's control over Danny plot. There was clearly something there, but because they had only seven episodes, they really couldn't pull it <laughs> off. I mean, do you think that's in the end that like he's, he's, I mean, it's weird that, that Danny is, is a pawn because he sees it. It's, it's more like we're transferring the pawn from Tyrion to John, um, which is, which is odd. You know, like that last shot of Tyrion uh, being upset that that they're having sex. Was he upset? Or at least, uh, it seems like it. It's lurking. Uh, yeah, like I, I don't know what the hell that was. A lot of people don't know what that was. A lot of people think that because of that last scene, Tyrion betrayed Danny and John, and he's kind of like, or at least he betrayed Danny, but he didn't betray John, and he doesn't want John and Danny getting together because he likes John and he doesn't want John to get caught up in the, his betrayal. Um, that's what some people believe. I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Uh, to be honest, I think you're looking at, at show Tyrion like you're looking at book Tyrion. The, the whole, you know, talking mm. about like Danny's his pawn or whatever. I mean, yeah, maybe in the books yeah, that I would mean, be a right. thing, but in the show, nah. Tyrion in the show is a good guy. In in the books, his his morality level is like very, is <laughs> it's it, he's very gray. He's like we don't really know if we like yeah. him that much. You know, we like him because he's a funny dwarf, and the book focuses on him a lot, and we kind of sympathize with him. But in the show, it's just like we like Tyrion because of his one-liners. Yeah, I mean, and you're right that like, so Tyrion in the show is definitely like 
there's no ambiguity here. Tyrion in the show is a good, is supposed to be a moral character. Well, book Tyrion is the further, you know, furthest thing from. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the furthest thing compared to others, but he is definitely not a good dude. I mean, book Tyrion, you know, once ordered a guy to be killed and then cannibalized and put into a soup. So it's it's just and you know strangled as uh, anyway. But it would be. You know, when I see these things that are out there, like, is it possible that Tyrion betrayed Danny and is teaming up with Cersei again? Is it possible that he's upset that that John has now power over Danny instead of him? And those things, it seems like there, is, there are scenes and possibilities for that, but it goes against all of the Tyrion as a moral person thing that's been going the whole time. Like, like you know, this would make sense in the books. What you're talking about right now would make sense in the books. Of, of so you're basically saying that Danny shouldn't really trust uh, Tyrion because he kind of wants to control her a little. And this would make sense uh, with uh, Quaithe's prophecy about the uh, the sun, sun, and the lion. Uh, you know how you shouldn't trust oh, him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, this would make a lot of sense. But Tyrion's a good guy. He he's probably just worried about these two getting together, and uh, you know, they probably shouldn't because. One of them could die. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what that fucking scene was in the end. Everybody's trying to dissect the shit out of it. I'm just like, ah, whatever. Well, Tyrion. Tyrion is now all of a sudden more. More. He's more break the wheel than 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 Danny now, which is which is interesting. And is he more break the wheel than Danny because he wants to be the new president? You know, is that what's going on? I don't think Tyrion wants to be the new president. I I, I think what it is is that. After season four, he kind of gave up on everything, and seeing Danny again and talking to her and you know, experiencing things near her and how she can you know kind of turn the tide of a lot of shit, gave him hope again. He doesn't want to lose that hope. He he wants his life back in a sense, and he wants what's rightfully his, which is the family legacy. And he doesn't want to fucking lose that hope. He doesn't want to lose what he could have, because he gave up on it before after he yeah. killed his father, and he has it again. He doesn't want to fucking lose it to you know. A mistake that she be, may be making with John. I mean, I can see him trying to control her over that, because without yeah. Danny there, it, it's like it's like it's like how he almost begged her not to go rescue them, you know, because she yeah. is the last chance. And what and without he, her seemed there, quite genuine. He seemed quite genuine that without that without her, they were all lost. More like he's lost. You know, Everybody will, will go on just fine. Well, I mean, they have also like made Tyrion into this man of the people kind of thing, right? He he had an he had a, he had sex with enough sex workers to all of a sudden like <laughs> feel for the common folk. And, you know, Danny is the, you know, the 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 hero of the common folk, uh freeing slaves and such. So, they should be on that side. They should be on the same side in that sense. But Tyrion also likes power, or at least book Tyrion likes power. You know, does show Tyrion like power as much? I, I think show Tyrion likes power. I mean, in season three, the whole thing with him was that he really wanted uh, something for himself. And he went to his father, and his father basically said, no, fuck you, you're not getting Casterly Rock. Uh, you're going to get what I give yeah. you and what I feel like you deserve. And I, I feel like ever since that, that, that's his whole thing. You know, he wants what's coming to him. He wants what he rightfully deserves. And that's something to call his own. He's not a bad guy. He's not Ramsey. Yeah. He's not Joffrey. He's a good guy who just happens to be short. And uh, nobody's giving him his due. I, I think Danny, for him, this season was his chance of finally getting that. And when he said, when he told her that without you, we're all lost, he really just meant, I'm lost. And he also really likes his family. So even though he hates his family, he likes his family. I like so, that. I, 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 yeah, you called it. Absolutely. You fucking called it, dude. Like the whole, like him giving Danny bad advice, maybe not on purpose, maybe subconsciously, to, to yeah. save Jamie and, and uh, Cersei the death of Dragonfire. You, you called that right on the, right on the money. But that, that's, that's what I want. I mean, this is why people are wondering, like, did he make a deal with Cersei, you know, because we have these three competing things going on, right? His, his, his love for power, his love for his family, and his love for the common man. And um, all of those, and yet, you know, also the show makes him, tries to make him a good person. But if you have those three together, his love for his family, his love for the common man, his love for power, you could put those all together and say, well, what Tyrion really wants to do is he really, he really wants to rule. Because he'll think that he'll be the best for the common man and he'll be advancing his family and he'll have power. 
You know, that would be the logical thing, right? <laughs> well, what, what would be the deal? He gets to rule Castle Rock. He gets, what, Dragonstone? Like, what does he get? Well, what, what's the deal here? Oh, if he and Cersei, like, teamed yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, does he He knows Cersei. The, the, Tyrion's not a glutton for punishment. He, he knows Cersei. Cersei has tried to have him killed before, I'm sure. And uh, he... he he knows Cersei. He knows how Cersei is, and she's not going to change. Even if, even if Danny loses and he made a deal with Cersei, he knows fully he, well yeah, he she, knows that, she's going to go back on it. That's true. That's true. He also doesn't see Danny as someone that he can control anymore. So... Why could he ever control her, though? I mean, Danny's very... I don't want to say she's arrogant. You always have to kind of like... You always have to kind of like tippy toe around the whole like Danny being arrogant thing because then you'll have people in the comment section calling you like a woman hater. You just don't like strong females in power. Yeah. I don't know. It's just she comes across as, she comes she comes across as arrogant to me, but that's okay because she's she's what nineteen in the show twenty nineteen twenty one thirty one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> stop it the show i i have no clue anywhere she's anywhere from 12 to 50 <laughs> um based on the timeline i uh <laughs> but, but she comes across as arrogant i don't think she'd listen to anyone maybe she'll take their advice into consideration but uh i, th I think the only advice she ever take she ever took in season seven was basically um uh what elena tyrell said which is be a dragon Right, but I mean, if 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 that's Danny's plot, Danny's plot seems to be, when is she gonna take control? Right. So the the story begins with her listening to Tyrion, um, and his, and his horrible plan, mm -hmm. and Alina saying, "Yeah, dude, you got you gotta you gotta be the dragon, do your own thing," and Danny, I have to say, actually, Danny's plot is probably the one that has the most actual, like story and structure to it like it starts in one place and it it ends in a way that you know it resolves in a in a in a, in a way that uh like builds on that so like Tyrion Tyrion has all of these plans and then and then she's told like you have to you have to come into your own and put your advisors aside and then in the end she does she puts she puts her advisor aside and she goes on her dangerous mission they keep telling her, oh, don't risk yourself. And then she, she doesn't listen to him and she, she risks, she takes the risks. And in the end, she, uh, you know, for better or for worse, like she, she becomes the leader and, and puts Tyrion aside. And, you know, I guess he's upset because maybe Jon Snow has, has influence over her. It's maybe she's trading one, one controller for another. I don't know if Jon Snow is... Jon Snow doesn't really come across the season as trying to control her. In fact, he's he's quite subservient to her, but maybe Tyrion sees him as controlling her. I don't know. He did convince her to to change her focus to battling the north. So, I mean, there, there she did have that evolution of of she's going to she's going to come into her own or something. But the whole Lannister things, I mean, we spoke about Jamie before. Um, Lannister is this season. Step up from season six? Uh, uh, da, da, da. I would say yes. so, yeah. Yes. I would say cross the... I would say definitely, even though Tyrion... <laughs> I mean, season six, Tyrion is sitting around drinking and and making jokes and doing things, like making plans that aren't really logical, that, that somehow work out in the end you know i mean I, season six i'm just trying to make sense of Tyrion, like like getting involved with the red priestesses and how they like control the city and then nothing came of that i was so hoping for something to come of that nothing came of that yeah and, and and making a deal with the slavers that then just kind of falls apart and so danny just has to kill them all and we put dario in charge and everything's peachy i mean nothing nothing really made sense it was just kind of him and I, when I think back, I just think him and Miss Sandy and Grey Worm telling jokes, and I'm like, ah, is that was that the season? I don't know. I really but don't remember this... Tyrion that much in season six, to be honest. I think he had, right? I think he didn't have that much screen time. But when he did, he's just it was just cringy and just didn't really care about him. I, I I remember finding it very hard to really talk about him in season six because he he really did not do that much. This season he has plans, and they all go awry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which is fine. I mean, I think I th- thought that was super fucking funny. I thought it was very clever that he subconsciously maybe he's fucking up on purpose to save his siblings from a gruesome death. I mean, that's fine. Except, yes. To me, the most t- the, the time that he really shined for me was when he and Danny came at odds with each other. You know, their, their whole their whole discussion in season and uh, episode six was was fine. I like that. And uh, you know, their little spat in episode four, spoilers of war, the the Lannisters versus the dragon one. I, I like that, too, where she finally calls him out. I mean, I don't know. I would like for Tyrion to have betrayed Danny. I mean, that would put Game of Thrones back on the mark in terms of betrayal for me. But uh, I doubt that's going to happen. He's too much of a good guy. I mean, him, Tyrion subconsciously, Tyrion subconsciously or consciously trying to protect his family is, in my opinion, the most clever aspect of season seven. And the show is aware of it because because Danny, it's not accidental. Danny does mm-hmm. accuse him of it. So, I you know I'm, I'm I'm I do I appreciate that plot. Like I do think it's the best aspect of the season that Tyrion, like purposely, or maybe not purposely, but it was Tyrion that even the score and and caused Danny to fuck up. Um, and you know it it would be it would be interesting if Tyrion. Um, became an enemy in season eight. I, I don't know if that'll of happen. Of course, it's not going to happen. That would be clever. Like the the fans yeah. love Tyrion, so the showrunners are going to do the best they can to make sure Tyrion has a semi good happy ending. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I'm actually wondering how they're going to bring the two plots together. Because if if Cersei stays home, and everybody else is fighting up the north, you know, up north, like how is it ever going to resolve? But. I mean, the only thing is, I guess they have to lose Winterfell. They have to keep heading south uh, into Cersei's territory in order for the characters to meet again. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's going to happen. Let's talk about the best newcomer of the season, which I don't think there was mm. any new characters. But besides the uh, the uh, guy at the Citadel, I forgot his name already, uh, Grand Maester or uh, Archmaester, I forgot his name. Oh, uh, is it Periston? <laughs> I don't um, fucking know. I, I'm, 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 com- no, it's Ebros. Ebros, it's there Ebros. we go. It's Ebros. Besides yeah, yeah. him, I don't think there were any new characters this season. If there were, I, I don't really recall. Um, but, um, well, I, I mean, Randall Tarley is pretty close. No, I, I wouldn't mean, go yes, Randall Tarley. One, he had one big scene last season, but I wouldn't go Randall Tarley. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Euron. No, I mean, I think Ebros, I think Ebros did a great job. I mean, uh, and, I, and I think Euron did a great job. But Ebros doesn't stand out like Euron does. Like, even though, like, Euron was here last season, he still did a good job this season regardless. Like, people complained. The main complaint people had for Euron this season was that he was too cartoony. But I kind of like that. Like, in a show where everyone is either stone-faced or depressed or kind of in a good mood, it's nice to have someone who yeah. enjoys being a douchebag. We don't, we don't get many of those. We just get random thug number seven who enjoys being evil for the sake of it. And I, No, you're absolutely and right. And I think Red Letter Media said it best about uh, Star Wars episode... Uh, three revenge of the sith where they said about palpatine that um they enjoyed palpatine's character above everybody else because you know palpatine is someone who enjoys being evil and you can see it on his face uh, that, that's why mm. i like Euron. Euron enjoys being a douchebag i just didn't like his, I mean, his choice is, of wardrobe this is uh i heard the same justification though of of um of jar jar <laughs> that no no seriously though but like if you go back and say okay like if story is about you know, stories are all about character conflict. Like what, like what is the only, who is the only person in the entire first movie that has it won a personality and represents conflict? And the answer is Jar Jar. Like no one else has a personality. Everyone else is the most vacuous, boring schmutz. Like the whole, the whole thing, like Shmi Skywalker, Anakin, uh, Padme, Obi Wan, Qui Gon, Mace Windu—like they're all the most boring <laughs> things on the planet. And the only character, the actual planet, they're—they're they're all eventually that, on one planet. He's right. <laughs> yeah, they're—they're they're so boring. Everyone is so boring, and Jar Jar is the only one with any personality. Well, no, Anakin. Anakin is kind of like—he's naive. He's a child. I mean. I mean, I mean, I'm stretching it out here. I'm, 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 I mean, I suppose there's there's Anakin's master, that that floating bird guy or bug guy. Oh, uh, Watto. You know, he kind of. 
Watto has a personality, I suppose. Um, and so does like the other Gungan, the Gungan King. But everybody else is so boring. I was actually going to ask the, you about this a while ago. So when I was younger, uh, episode nine came out. Episode nine. Episode one came out in 1999. Mm. I was seven, maybe eight years old when it came out. And I don't mm. remember it that much. I like like I only started noticing about people hating Jar Jar Binks like when I got into like high school. Uh, Jar Jar mm. was never really like a character I hated or liked. It was just he was just there. But uh, you're old enough to remember episode one. What was your thoughts on it? Yeah. I know we're going way off into Star Wars territory. But... Uh, they, well, they, well, I mean, we'll bring it back because this is this is about this is about Euron. <laughs> um, I mean, keep in mind that I'm old enough. I I saw, I saw both Empire and Return in the uh, in the in the mm-hmm. theaters, and um, the Ewoks, even as a kid, like they were divisive. Like some people like liked the Ewoks and had all the Ewok toys, even as a little kid. And keep in mind, I was small. I was like, you know, I was like six, you know. And even at six, I thought the Ewoks were lame. <laughs> um, and it was quite divisive. Like everyone, you know, like liking the Ewoks or not. But it, it was definitely the Ewoks were this were this Jar Jar character. Mm-hmm. And from what I've read, I've read articles where, where people said when Empire came out, the question of whether or not Yoda was cool and divisive or ruined the whole thing came out was was an issue. And apparently in the original, in 77, um, Star Wars, uh, the question is whether or not R2-D2 and C-3PO were the ones ruining the whole the whole uh, movie with their with their antics. Um, so there's always these characters, there's always these cartoonish characters that people question uh, whether or not they're ruining the story um, with their antics. To certain, you know, to certain degrees, obviously, like Jar Jar is so over the top that it's it's hard to take. Um, versus, you know, is Yoda in Empire Strikes Back over the top? I, I don't know. I, I think Empire is pretty freaking good movie. I don't think of Yoda as being over the top. I feel like this is. I feel like you're trying to bring this to like uh, to like Gilly. Like, is Gilly over the top? Is does Gilly is Gilly the Jar Jar Binks of uh, Game of Thrones? But go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, Gilly. I, I, I don't know. Gilly. Gilly's fine. <laughs> I have no problem with Gilly. She's fine. <laughs> but did you like Episode One when it first came out? Uh yeah. I want to say the first time through you finish and you go, okay. I mean, you kind of, you do recognize the flaw. Um, but yeah, after all the explosions and everything and the nostalgia and the, and the music and the, and the lightsaber fights, the first time through, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of like, wow, that was, that was, that was pretty cool. I mean, I saw, I saw episode one in the theaters three times when it came yes. out. Um, yeah. And so it was it was a big deal and then it took it took a little time for everything to settle in um you know a week or two or a second viewing to kind of to kind of go oh that was really that was really kind of sucky you know <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna. I'm actually gonna bring it back to Star Wars because I have a question for you in the audience in re, in relation to Star Wars, the prequels, and uh, Game of Thrones. But uh, yeah, Euron, I would give best newcomer. You know, he came in. Last season wasn't that great. He had like what less than fifteen minutes of screen time, and then this season yeah. he definitely redeemed himself. So I would give Euron Greyjoy best newcomer. Um, but let's talk about. By the way, can you still continue? Sure, sure. Let's talk about John and Danny for a moment. I don't. I want to. I don't want to stay on this for too long because we've we've torn apart so much at this point that we're just being a dead horse. But um, a couple of episodes ago, you gave me an example of some college who did a study based on how people get together by knowing each other better. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah go, yeah. go into that because it, it kind of summed up why Danny and Daryl work so well, but why John and Danny doesn't. Like, just go through it real quick. Um, well, it it the study was essentially uh, you you break you break people off into pairs, and you you have them ask them interview questions, and some of the interview questions are are you know lighthearted kind of stuff like oh what's your favorite food what's your favorite movie. You know, and then other ones are really deep and sometimes uh, difficult. You know, like what was a time in which you had an extreme loss in your life? Um, talk about a time where someone close to you died. Uh, where what was a time in which you had a challenge that you failed at? You know, and so these these things that are much like more personal, 
um, they're not as pleasant. But at the end, when when ranking how close you felt to somebody, um, the uh, people ranked somebody that they talked about something you know very hard and personal with uh, um, a, a, as being closer. And actually, out of the study, you know, of these like hundred freshmen, something like four relationships, like romantic relationships, like bloomed from it. Um, which is interesting to think about when, when even if you're talking about regular dating, because like most of us think, <clears throat> oh, when we go on dates, we want to be the fun guy, so that, you know, she thinks, oh, I, you know, it's it's she he's so funny and so fun to be around. Well, in truth, we're not all necessarily looking for fun. We're looking for empathy in life, mm-hmm. and that actually talking about things that are personal, even if they're like negative and and, and downers, actually makes someone feel bonded to you more. So. Maybe, you know, on that first date, don't don't worry about necessarily being so fun. Maybe try to actually talk about, you know, things that are, um, you know, real and, 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 and hard. And, you know, might, it might be more effective than, than, than being the, the fun guy. Um, but, yeah, that was the problem with, like, Danny and John versus, like, Dario and Danny. Like, Dario and Danny kind of worked because Dario, like... We had a scene where Dario talked about his backstory and how he was abused as a child and was thrown into the uh, the uh, fighting pits. And it worked. Like, I felt closer to Dario, and I believed the Danny and Dario relationship more than the Danny and John relationship. It's a bit weird because Dario is also the fun character. Mm-hmm. So, so, But John and Danny, they don't really talk about like the, the hardship of their lives. Um, you know, they look at some cave doodles together uh, and they, you know, they talk about their missions and stuff. It also doesn't help that John um, is kind of boring. I mean, the last two guys Danny was with, yeah. like, they were, they were uh, to quote uh, my own uh, made up character, Game of Thrones fan, 42, 42. Uh, Cal, <laughs> Cal Drogo and Dario were popping. You know what I'm saying? They were fresh. And then you have oh. John who's kind of like, meh, meh. Uh, right. Mm. I, you know, if all they needed was like one scene of John talking about, you know, how, you know, Cat was really mean to him or how, you know, he, he was really sad when his brother Rob was killed and it, like and it meant a lot, you know, or or, you know, how it felt that that his sister Arya and his sister and his brother Bran have, have been missing and how he thinks about them every day. Like those kind of things. Uh, would be very useful in, in, in establishing like why we think these two are bonded. Mm-hmm. And um, you know? not only that, but uh, Jon Snow and Danny. I, this is the reason. The, so, someone someone came at me and they said, "Well, well, the same thing could be said about Danny and Dario because the moment Dario met Danny, he was like immediately into her. Like, yeah, okay, fine." Dario was immediately into her, but Dario went to great strides to try to prove his loyalty to Danny and, and why he loves her, you know? I mean, the guy met mm-hmm. her. He was already established in a mercenary company. He killed, like, two guys, uh, helped take down an entire city full of guards or whatever, you know, give her a city yeah. and uh, fight the champion of Marine for her. Also, you know, giving her some uh, some other other stuff. And uh, he tried. He tried. He was in, invested, and, you know, he had personality, and he showed it. John and Danny, like, them getting together, like, you don't really n- notice anything until towards the end. Like, it, it it just seemed rushed. And and not only that, but them getting together, like, the way they did, not only was it rushed, but it was also expected. You expected them to get together because it seems like the perfect match and because it's two main yeah. characters. I've said this before. Game of Thrones works best when you get something you're not expecting. That's why the Red Wedding, Night's mm-hmm. Execution, Jamie's hand being cut off, Cersei's walk of shame, John being stabbed. Like, if you never read the books and didn't, you know, like, see the leaks ahead of time, you didn't expect shit like that to happen. And they are some of the best moments in the show. But everybody wanted them to get together. And wouldn't it have been, a, wouldn't have been better when John, you know, knocked on Danny's door and she looked at him longingly and he's like, all right, good luck. And he high fives her, and he walks out. Like, <laughs> he high fives. He high fives her and walks out. Like, all right, peace out. Like, punches her on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he gets together with Miss Sandy. I don't know. Yeah. Um, what a twist. What a twist. <laughs> 
it's tough. It's also tough because because, I mean, let's be let's be honest. Like, uh, the 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 Dario actors. I think one is Michael Weissman and the other is Ed Screen. It's, I don't know how to pronounce. He's Francis. Name. He will forever be known as Francis. Francis. Uh, Deadpool. Right. They are they are both just such astonishingly better actors than than Kit Harrington. <laughs> um, and both of them. Even though, like, the scenes with Danny, the, 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 there's sexual tension because those characters are emitting the sexual tension. And so you feel mm-hmm. it, even if even if Danny doesn't, even if Danny, because let's be honest, uh, <laughs> you know, the, um, uh, you know, she's not such a great actress. Uh, but the, uh, there's so much sexual tension in those scenes and you feel it. You mm-hmm. feel, I mean, if there was a pile of, you know, if there was a linoleum floor instead of Danny, you'd still feel the sexual <laughs> tension. Um, so the problem, you just didn't feel anything. Just didn't feel anything with, with uh, the John and Danny scenes. Um, it's tough. And, and so maybe, I, you know, like I said, it, it might have helped if, if they had a, a conversation about their childhood, mm-hmm. you know, what was, what was, what was Danny's life like with Viserys, you know, or, um, what is it like, what is it like, what is it really like to have her, her dragons gone? She says that her dragons are like her children, but have we ever really established that? Not um, really. Like when, when they were old enough to like do stuff, she kind of locked them away. We only really ever saw Drogon. Right, and Drogon was gone and missing mm-hmm. most of the season, mm-hmm. right? So, th- this is why I, I will always love John and Egret. Uh, I'll admit this: in season two, John's whole thing was just, it was my favorite part of season two, but it, it yeah. does eventually grow into season three with John and Egret's relationship being so fun. Like there was one, <laughs> there was one scene in season three where uh, yeah. uh, did I mention to you about this uh, the windmill thing? Did we just, just discuss this before the windmill? Uh, remind me of the of this windmill thing. I, I so don't John, know. so it's season three. John and John and Egret and the Tormund's group, they're beyond. They're not beyond the wall. They're uh, on the uh, Westeros side of the wall, and yes. um, they recently went hunting, and they're walking by this like windmill, and, and Egret, so adorable. She goes, "Is that a palace? Is that a castle?" And John's like, "No, that's a windmill. Windmill. Who built it? Some king." It's the people who lived here. And, like, it's just such a cute moment. And then, like, uh, he goes, maybe I'll take you to... Oh, with Queen's, with Queen, Queen's Crown Tower? Or do they, I mean, do they change it? I don't show? fucking know. But it, it's such a cute moment. Okay, and, okay. and John's like, maybe I'll take you to Winterfell someday. And, and she goes, maybe I'll take you to Winterfell someday. It's, like, such a nice little cute moment. Yeah. And he goes, I want to see you in a dress so I can rip it off you. And then she goes... If you rip my dress up, I'll blacken your eye. Like it's such a cute moment. I yeah. love that scene. Such a great moment. And it, it works. It works because one, Rose Leslie is, is an amazing actress. Really yeah. phenomenal. She's a she's a phenomenal actress. But but also it works because Kit Harrington isn't acting in that scene. <laughs> like he doesn't. Like Kit Harrington's a horrible actor. And, and he's not acting in that scene. Like he actually has sexual tension and love for mm-hmm. Rose Leslie. You know. So like. That's. I think that's also why it worked. Is that that one? You know, maybe maybe Kit Harrington needs a, a good actor across from him, and Rose Leslie is. A but great but is actor, John? But also, but does the role of John Snow acting, really need yeah. it to be acted out? I mean, John Snow is very. He's borderline emo. I mean, do you really need someone? Do you need someone who's acting chops of Marlon Brando uh, or Al Pacino or? Uh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> you're right. Like book book John is the most boring. Uh, character in the in the entire story. I mean, heteronormative, uh, classic hero type who you know who is that? Uh, he's the as I as I've talked about before. He's the 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 man on the bathroom door that all men can relate to because he's so empty, and you can just put yourself right mm-hmm. in there and relate to nothing. You know. Let's continue on. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? You want to talk about? Let's talk about Theon. <laughs> Okay. Really? There, and there's talk about the sad... there are things to say about Theon. I mean, other than him being there. This and... is this is what's so sad, though. Is is you're talking about, you know, one of the you know one of the great actors of the show. Um, you know, maybe after Lena Headey and and Peter Dinklage, like Alfie Allen is you know just a fantastic, fantastic actor, and we kind of saw how brilliant he was 
in uh, seasons two, three, and four, you know, and and even five, he was saving the show. And then they just kind of stopped utilizing him, which is really sad because he's, he's so good. It's because he's a second-tier character. I mean, uh, he, he's not one of the big five or the big six or big seven, whatever you want to call it. He's a second-tier character. And George really didn't outline a lot. There's not a lot of bullet points for him towards the very final page of the books. The last last book, yeah. final page. There's not a lot of bullet points for him, so they kind of had to make stuff along. And we all know the showrunners and even the writers for the show, they don't really know what to do with him because they really can't... Maybe George didn't even think of an ending for Theon. No, I mean, it's true. He's I a second-tier character. It, maybe it, he's not really part of the endgame book. Maybe he dies next book. Who knows? So one of the things one of the things George writes a lot about that um, uh, I have a tough time relating to too much is how much sibling rivalry he has in in the story. Like I don't I don't really have that much sibling rivalry with my siblings. Maybe some people do. Like I don't really have like these massive love hate relationships with mm-hmm. them. Like my siblings, you know, you know I love them. They're off doing their own thing. Uh, I don't think about them day to day, but George, his story is filled with like just serious hatred slash love for siblings. Mm-hmm. You know, Tyrion, Tyrion, Cersei, Jamie, Cersei, Jamie, Tyrion, uh, Sansa, Arya, and the big one, of course, is the Theon Asha character from the, you know from the book and how much they hate each other and how they're fighting for the same position, and then. There's residuals of that, obviously, because we follow the story in, 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 in the show. And then all of a sudden they've, they've switched it to, no, their relationship is 100% like affectionate, loving siblings. And Theon needs to rescue his sister. And it's very odd because, you know, Ash, or Yara, her love for Theon is mixed. Like, and Theon's love for her is mixed. Like, she did betray him and abandon him. And all sorts of other things, and and then abuse him when he came, and convince him that that she needed to rule the Iron Islands and all this. And now that plot is all gone, and it's just it's a damsel in distress, his sister, but a damsel that needs to be uh, rescued in order for him to somehow get over his PTSD. Like I said, I I, I think you hit the nail on the head last time. When you said uh, uh, about Theon, how in season two he came, uh, what was that one scene you told me about in season two? The one where I think it's episode nine, where uh, he's talking to Maester Lewin, and yeah, and, and yeah. how they kind of ruined that scene and with him talking to John. No, it's 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 one of the, it's one of the best scenes the show ever had. It, it improves upon the book, um, uh, Alfie Allen's performance and what they wrote there. It's it's a it's a fantastic it's a fantastic scene of of Theon remembering what it was like to be a ward and how painful it was. Um, better better than the book, I think it, it was. And it's yeah. It's and how everybody was telling him he should be lucky. He's the ward of Ned Stark and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Theon, they didn't really give yeah. him that much to do, and it's a shame. But at the same time, what is there for him to do? It's a good. I mean, it's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, with seven episodes left, we're gonna have to focus on John and Danny. Where does Theon uh, fit into this? I mean, it's true that like all of the characters that Theon really like cared about are gone, right? Like Theon. Theon's story is about his his friendship with Rob. Rob's dead. It's about his uh, role as a son to either Balon or Ned. They're both dead. Um, and then it's about his uh, contentious relationship, sibling rivalry with his sister. And she's gone. Um, and she's captured, right. So, and it's about his like abuse relationship with Ramsay, mm-hmm. and he's dead. So the only thing left is the contentious relationship with his sister. And then they kind of erase that. I don't think they erased it. I, I like, think by him not rescuing Yara when he when he had the chance. I mean, we all agree that he couldn't have done anything. I think I think they're trying to save him up, uh, set him up for her redemption season eight. Uh, will he get that redemption? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But um, there was really nothing for him to do this season. I mean, 
There wasn't. There wasn't. I mean, they, because they're setting it up. I mean, they gave him, as I said, the uh, the the bark and the bark and bin boss battle <laughs> with with that with was what's so his face. cringy when the guy tries to knee him in the crotch and he's that was so cringy. I don't know what they were up to. With I mean, it's just. I don't even know if that guy got killed or was he just <laughs> lying just, on the beach. They just left him there. With a bloody nose. I don't know. I don't know. But let's let's discuss some of the pros for Season 7. For me, I, I enjoy the CGI, which has been improved. I like that we finally mm-hmm. got a sea battle and we saw the Greyjoys get some love. The past few seasons, we saw very little of them and they just kind of sucked. I mean, like I said, Euron came in for 15 yeah, minutes yeah. and that was it. Uh, the, the battles were great. I enjoy the visuals for them. Some of the characters got much better storylines this season, apart from last season, where they just sat around. Characters like Danny, they actually did. She actually... Danny def- definitely, definitely. Danny had much better, had much mm-hmm. more to do. It, even though some of the sure. shit she did was dumb, she was actively going around and, you know, using her dragons. Cersei wasn't just a High mm-hmm. Sparrows bitch, kind of like how she was in uh, Season 6. She, she was just a High Sparrows punching bag, you know, complaining about him every scene. Jamie Braun, Varys got his own little spotlight early on, which is fine, which is good. And I will say this, for as much shit as we give them, the John and John and Danny's first meeting was was done all right. Um that was like It was an, it was an exciting, yeah, it was an exciting. That was a uh, delicate little, moment little and I think they did, did okay on that. Uh, uh, uh or uh, as the uh the the, the scene the, the Sam and Diane moment that that got my uh that got one of my videos uh copyright flagged. <laughs> <laughs> I won. I won. <laughs> but yes. If you put in a scene from Cheers, your CBS is going to copyright strike you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, your favorite character, Sam, I mean, yeah, he, he did something oh, cool. Yeah. He got uh, Jorah back in the fight, and he gave John some crucial information that eventually had him meet up with Danny. But other than that, uh, what does Sam really do? We got a shit montage. I, would, I mean, I would argue that the Sam story is the worst one. I mean, besides, like, Brienne's story being horrible or something like that or Davos um like the Sam story I think is the is the one they screwed up the most and it's the one they could have easily made the best but they just really they just played it they played it everything in the wrong order um had they just started him off loving the Citadel you know and had him progress towards hating the Citadel rather than starting him off hating Mm. the Citadel you know then it would have maybe perhaps worked you know I don't know. Fucking shit montage. <laughs> Sam, I feel as though we uh, we gotten all we can from Sam. I think Sam has really accomplished everything he can as a character. I really don't see him doing much in season eight, but maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe other people can see him doing everything, but I really don't feel like Sam has much left to do other than give Heartsbane to John when Longclaw breaks eventually. Mm. And uh, by the way, I don't know if it's going to break. Just That's not a spoiler. I don't know if it's going to. I just feel like it will. Or oh, And... Uh, I think, Go ahead. well, I, the, the, the thing with the Sam story, and, and again, maybe I'm projecting because there's so much potential in the Sam story in the book, like so much. I mean, you've got Faceless Man and Euron glass candle. And, and Sorella Sand and Glass Candles <laughs> and all of this going on and the Brave Companions showing up and all this shit that's going to happen in Old Town that I'm just like, I'm just, you know, can't wait for. But... The, the one thing that they could have done with, with Sam is, is there is a parallel of Sam to Bran in that, you know, Sam, Old Town is, he is like a three-eyed, he is like a three-eyed crow, a three-eyed raven. I mean, he is in a place with infinite knowledge um, like Bran is. And yeah, they, they, I guess they do kind of use him in the same respect in that he's exposition. Um I guess they did. I didn't need him to leave Old Town at the end. Um, he could have stayed at the Citadel longer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Like, we didn't need him to find out about John's parentage. Bran could have just done that. Yeah. And, I mean, there could be more stuff. I mean, it's weird that, that he's so successful in what he's doing and yet is disillusioned by it. Like, he finds the dragon glass, he cures Jorah, and he finds out about the parentage. Like that's all from his time there. Like, why? Why does he think he can do more going to Winterfell? Like, how is he going to do more? The Winterfell Library got burned down. True. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of the books he brought with him, some of them just by chance or luck, has like a a better answer on how to beat the White Walkers. I honestly think he's just there just just to give John Heartsbane, just give some one of the soldiers or one of the main characters Heartsbane because he brought it with him. So. Mm. 
I honestly don't know. They got to give every character. It's like it's like why did the dagger return so Arya could have a a, a Valyrian steel dagger so she could have a, like a badass fight. little White Walker. Yeah, that's clearly clearly why. I, I still I still laugh when you, like like the whole thing about like like Lord Baelish, I sentence you to death. Arya carried it out. With pleasure. And then Baelish takes out his own sword and he fights her proficiently, like, fucking good at it. Like, oh, damn, where did that come from? Holy shit. That would be incredible. Like, he is actually secretly this this incredible bravo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they do have hints of that in the book. <laughs> do they really? Like, when he... When, well, when he when he climbs down the cliff that Ned is super scared on, like, he just does it immediately really fast. And you're like, oh... <laughs> Well, that's, that's he, he comes off as like someone who's physical. not that great. Like, didn't he lose against Ned's brother? Yeah, but he's tiny, and that was years ago. Imagine if he's been in training all of those years. <laughs> you know? Someone, someone gave me the. Uh, I know we're going back to Littlefinger a little. Someone gave me like the, uh, the what if? Like, what if Littlefinger was behind Robert's rebelling all this time? Because um, this is also something we briefly spoke about last time. How uh, Bran said that Robert Robert's rebellion was built on a lie. That that uh, Rhaegar mm. and Lyanna were, were actually in love and he didn't really kidnap her. But who told who told um, Ned's brother Brandon about her being kidnapped? Right. I mean, some people do talk about that, that, that the ru- the kidnapping rumor came from, from Littlefinger, that in fact, like, Rhaegar was like, dude, we totally eloped. And then, and then Littlefinger spread the lie that it was mm-hmm. a kidnapping. But realistically, in the book... Um, even if it were not a kidnapping, it, it doesn't, it doesn't change things. Like you already have a betrothal. Betrothals cannot be broken, um, except with the high Septon again, you know, or, or the, the agreement of your Lords. So like, you know, it's, it's still her father, Rickard and, and Ares and people like that need to break betrothals, you know, and, and host her Tully, um, uh, and and dealing with this whole situation, like this whole mix up. Um, I'm sorry, Liana, and and it would be, uh, I guess Robert was the um, the Lord at the time, so Robert would need to break the betrothal with Rickard. He wasn't going to do that. And yeah, I mean these things are big deals. I mean like Joffrey Joffrey has to have the high has to have the high Septon break his betrothal to Sansa. Like it was, it was that important, and he's the he was the freaking king at the time. So, 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 so the rebellion re- really wasn't built on a lie. It was basically built on like Rhaegar doing whatever the fuck it is he wanted, and them not following the traditions, the rules. Right, and it, it was no, it's apparently no secret that that they eloped. I mean, that's that's what Danny and Viserys apparently believed. So, or that they ran off together. Uh, um, it's still a question of whether or not they were married. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what Danny and Viserys believed. So apparently somebody believes that. In fact, it's the first story we're, we're, we're um, introduced to, that Rhaegar and Lyanna were in love. The second story is that the rape happens. So it, it's always that there were two sides of it. So I don't, I don't know where the built on a lie thing came from. Um, I don't know if they can do that in the book. We'll see. But even if that were the lie it were built, it were built on, there's another truth to have the war start out anyway. Um, but but what did you like about the season seven? Um, I mean, I I liked the I liked the Alina death scene. I liked the flip. I liked how we were expecting a war to be at Casterly Rock, and there was the there was the twist, and in fact they were at High Garden. I thought that was quite clever. Um, the uh, an undead dragon is was is a is a intriguing idea. Um, I like the idea of Tyrion subconsciously sabotaging uh, Danny. That they put so, so you liked a lot of the story um, elements in the show. Yeah, I did, and you know, I, I, I liked I liked Euron and his and his um, and him uh, causing all of this chaos. So I mean, there, there, were, there were definitely some. There were definitely. But where, where did the six come from? Like for me, the six came. Uh, for me, the seven point five, I enjoyed it. Above average, not even above average. It's good, good. The season was good. The season yeah. was enjoyable, entertaining. But for me, the seven point five comes from characters not behaving like themselves, characters not being utilized in the correct yeah. way, and the dreaded episode just not being that great or unique this season, and uh, kind of us getting like things we've we. 
we didn't really get many surprises. I mean, the Ice Dragon, yeah, that's one surprise, but a normal Game of Thrones yeah. season throws at you a couple of surprises. Yeah, I mean, I think the downsides is is they were, they really played ha- you know fast and loose with with uh, distances and you know logic, healing times, things like that. You know, getting Jorah healed immediately and you know forgetting stuff that they did in the last episode. There's a lot of that. They they weren't very careful with the continuity. Um, I thought the the Sansa, Arya, Littlefinger situation was just a horrible horrible plot. Um, that was just dumb from beginning to end. Uh, I think that brought down the season a bunch. Um, you know, I thought that the John Danny romance was meh. I don't think it ruined anything by any means, but I thought it was meh. But I think the I think that the the Arya Sansa Littlefinger storyline is the thing that really weakened mm-hmm. the season. Like had they had they done a better job there, things would have been different. Um, but. That was that was the that was I think the real gut punch to everything. Well, this is my final question to you before we wrap things up. Um, mm. So, as we spoke about Star Wars, the prequels earlier in the podcast, uh, let me ask you this. So, this is how I feel about Star Wars. Now, I'm a big Star Wars fan, and uh, the prequels. We've all seen Red Letter Media's like you know savage destruction of the prequels, and uh, a lot of us agree with it, but. Now that we have the sequel trilogy with J.J. Abrams, Force Awakens, mm. Last Jedi, and the ninth, the ninth episode, I would argue that we were all a little too harsh on the prequels. Because say what you want about George Lucas. <laughs> I mean, I don't agree with the whole thing about people saying George Lucas raped their childhood because of the prequels. That's a little too fucking harsh. But we were all a little too caught up in hating George Lucas for the prequels. And granted, they're not great movies. Um, but... At least George Lucas took the liberty to go in a different route. He didn't just basically remade A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, like he like they're doing with yeah. Force Awakens. And from what I've seen, stills mm-hmm. and trailers of The Last Jedi. Um, so, f- yeah. ten years ago, people hated the prequels. Now we're kind of just seeing how maybe George Lucas wasn't an asshole after all. He was just trying to be as different and as separate from the original trilogy as he could be. Do you think we're going to get the same treatment for Game of Thrones seasons 5, 6, 7, and 8 10 years down the line when all the books are released? See, this is this is what I'm really struggling with. Now, now, yeah, like George Lucas, if you know, the prequels are ambitious. I think he fails in many respects, but they're super ambitious. They're different. It's not what we were expecting. He went in a completely different way. Um, Game of Thrones, and uh, because of Song of Ice and Fire, is ambitious. Um, we, you know, and good, and and good, and so Game of Thrones like hit us and and and, and got us. And what we're seeing right now is okay. We don't know the end of George R. R. Martin's books, so we're just kind of popping in uh, wh- what we've seen before it's essentially lord of the rings they're 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 putting in a kind of classic story to finish everything up like you know john saves the world is what we're expecting um i don't think that's going to be the books just knowing george r, r. martin's writing i mean maybe he'll he'll wimp out in the end and it'll just be john saving the world according to prophecy but i don't you know i don't I really don't think that's going to happen. But if George R. R. Martin really did tell the ending to Dan and Dave, like, shouldn't we see some of that super ambitious stuff in season eight? You know, like they, they didn't know what to do with seasons five, six and seven. So they popped in Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, you know, but shouldn't we get back to some of those endings that George R. R. Martin material by season eight and will it, will it affect us again? The, you know, being ambitious and new. If George R. R. Martin didn't do that, then we're going to see a we're going to see a Lord of the Rings ending. You know, prophecy fulfilled. A lot of people die, but in the end, the world is saved. Hooray! Um. So I don't know. You know, 
It depends. It depends if like we're going to copy some of the ambition of George R. R. Martin. Because there are some things in the books that George Martin has done that I was not a big fan of. One of the things I, I, I can recall off the top of my head right now is bringing back Lady Stoneheart. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, yeah, I think it was. I think it was pointless. I mean, we, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't. I can't. Um, so far, I'm just like I don't really care about Kathleen. I, I don't. Kathleen Tully. I don't care about her. Bringing her back as a, as a zombie out for revenge against Jamie and the, the phrase. Okay, that's kind of interesting. But at the same time, yeah, I, I just don't really care about it. Um, see this 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 is this is a a, a podcast idea because everybody accuses me of being a book snob and like gushing over the books like we could do an entire podcast of things we hate about the books <laughs> like that didn't that don't work that we're just like nah george's i mean i'm like beyond like the fat pink mast and 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 like you know pages on on carl the maid's semen or whatever like wait what carl the maid's semen i remember this oh carl the maid like you know you know the the sex that Asha and Carl the Maid have at the beginning of of, of a Dance with Dragons. I I, uh, I recall it, it's, it's I recall Danny's detail. diarrhea in the Dance of Dragons. I don't recall uh, Carl oh, Seaman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could go back, man. It's Jesus so important. Christ. It's key. Well, I mean, it, it might be important because my Asha might be pregnant, so perhaps the semen mm. is important. But you know, there's there's a lot of time dedicated to, you know, Carl the Maid's semen and and. Sam's penis and Danny's diarrhea. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, 10 years from now, will we forgive showrunners Dave and Dan for, uh, season five, I was actually, season five, actually, I think is actually the last good season. I actually really liked season five going back into it. I mean, yeah, the Sand Snake stuff kind of sucks cock, but, uh, season five, I would argue had two dreaded episodes, episode eight and nine, Hard Home and, uh, of uh, Dance Dance Dragons. Yeah. Um, but will we forgive Dave and Dan 10, 15 years down the line when George Martin has finished the, the novels and, you know, we come back, we look back and it wasn't as bad as we once thought? I think, I, I, th- I mean, I personally think that the novels are going to be very, very different and that George R. Martin is going to make them different. Um, it's, it's funny that so many people extrapolate very boring endings. And it's like, it's like, if you look at the books, like, we've got some pretty big surprises every book i mean you come to you come to a storm of swords and you have you have the red wedding and then you have then the next book you're expecting like a sequel to a storm of swords and it's a feast for crows which is just out of left field and you're like what what is this like dornish and ironborn out of nowhere and then you get to a dance with dragons and you're like all right finally we're gonna have the sequel to a storm of swords and it's not a sequel to A Storm of Swords. It's John and Danny doing nothing and a story about the Golden Company and Theon at a wedding. And you're like, Hold, what, the, what the hell is this? It's Every book is so unpredictable. Um, and so it's odd, you know, seasons five, six, seven being exactly what we were expecting. Like, oh, John's getting resurrected and he's going to win some battles. And, you know, the Night King is eventually going to get through the wall and then the dragons are going to fight the Night King. It's 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 what we're expecting. I mean, if it's George R. R. Martin, like, book six comes out, and I could imagine him being like, you know what? The others aren't even characters anymore. It's about the Squishers. <laughs> and the Squishers are, insa- are invading from the sea. And the, the real enemy this entire time was the Squishers. I would be like, wow, that's very George R. R. Martin. You know? So I don't know if we're ever going to forgive them. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the average Joe, when 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 a Lord of the Rings ending comes, will will be satisfied. Or maybe they stole the endings that George R. R. Martin told them, and we'll, we'll and will think, oh, this is really cool. But no, I kind of hope they don't do I don't that. Think, I, I kind of hope they gonna... don't go uh, George R. R. Martin's route and kind of just do their own thing. I think I think they they should do their own thing, have multiple endings, and let the audience figure out what we want, and we'll decide which ending it is. I mean, George R. R. Martin's route would be to leave the story super ambiguous at the end. Bittersweet and ambiguous and No, weird. don't leave it ambiguous. Fuck um, that. I want things answered. Uh, the George R. R. Martin, <sighs> that's what he does. His endings are never his endings are never concrete. In fact, even the show saying, Oh, Rhaegar and Lyanna were in love as a concrete thing is already very anti George R. R. Martin. Like George R. R. Martin, like he has these two narratives that we don't know and we may never know. Like they're just two narratives, Son of a bitch. <laughs> and he likes the mystery. 
That's what he does. Fucking, you know, he leaves things open. Let's let's wrap it up. We've been going for almost two hours now, which is a first for the podcast. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so check us out there. Follow either myself or Preston on Twitter for all updates on the next episode of the podcast. Be sure to leave your thoughts down below, and we may cover them in a future episode. Uh, Preston, what do you think is the uh, topic for the next? Of course, we're going to take questions and answer a couple of them. Uh, it'll be on your channel, of course. But uh, do you want to discuss some of the stuff we didn't like about the books? Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a, that'd be a fun that'd be a fun uh, topic. Let's do that. I got also a, I got also another a couple of uh, questions people have been throwing at us, and I've been saving them. So, you know, uh, we'll be discussing that next time. We'll be on your channel. Do you have any uh, things in the works, by the way? Um, I mean, my season reviews, and then I'm I'm back to I'm back to you know theory videos and and things like that. But uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. Sorry we're so late on this, but uh, hope you can forgive us. We gave you uh, two hours of stuff, almost two hours. So uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll all see you guys next time. Have a good one.